Mr. Cook, my friend, we know that the world is headed towards two wars. And we know the first of those two wars is uh, heavy on Muslim militants flooding into Israel and, and disrupting the world, uh, deploying the terrorists, their primary tactic, and the world is uh, ill-equipped to deal with them. Um, how do you see World War III playing out since uh, do you, do you see he, human behavior any different than than uh, we discussed in the, the last segment? No. No, it's going to be worse. It will absolutely be worse, especially by the second uh, or the fourth world war, if you're counting as a, as a historian counts. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that it's, uh, that it's not so clinical. You know, America likes to fight wars that are clinical, where you're dropping bombs from 30,000 feet so that the bombers don't know that they're burning women and children alive. They know it, but there's some cognizant uh, dissidence there. Somehow. And, uh, you know, you're dealing with cruise missiles being fired like it's a video game. And, yeah, you know that, uh, you're, that t t women and children are being blown to bits. And there's lots of collateral damage, but you really don't see it. Even up there in the uh, C-130 surrounding the hospital and constantly bombarding it, you don't know that people are being ripped apart inside. You think that might be a possibility, but, you know, you're, you can distance yourself from it. It's different when you hear the screams and you see the blood. Yeah. It's different when you know that uh, millions of little girls are being raped. Yeah. And boys are being sodomized. And if it was down the street from you instead of a continent away, an ocean away, yeah, it wouldn't be so easy to take. Yeah. Uh, so I see the results of of human behavior dipping to the point now. When, you know, as I encounter people now that it's just no sense of morality, no no sense of propriety or judgment or discernment, and uh, and, and no personal control. I mean, they're just literally out of control. If you you upset somebody today, I mean, they just go into a rage. I mean, they flip you the finger and, and all manner of, of foul language is just, just totally and completely uncontrollable and irrational. And so, you know, you get somebody that's enraged like that, that's, you know, hates themselves, hates the world, try then, you know, with a self-righteous attitude and foul-mouthed and, you know, I, I, I just think that's what we're going to see. We're going to see carnage up close and personal. Civility is grown. Yeah. If I was watching a, um, uh, oh, I know what it was. It was a an NFL, uh, on the NFL Network, the first NFL game was uh, filmed 70-some-odd um, years ago uh, today, and uh, they showed the stadium, and then they showed people watching television in their homes, and the women were dressed up. I mean, they were in their in beautiful dresses. The kids were, were beautifully attired, and the men were wearing suits and ties to the game and in their homes. I mean, I, you look at them, I, mean, I think they were overdressed. That's the way they went, the town. Yeah. And then you, you look, I remember when I first uh, traveled uh, for business, and, you know, I, I wasn't making much money initially, so I, I mean, I was flying coach. And, and I remember that we all dressed up to get on that airplane. Oh, yeah. And now you see people coming in their jogging suits and the, what looks like their pajamas and, uh, and just, I mean, the, the average person dresses so poorly, grooms themselves so poorly, that it's, it's kind of just a... Uh, it's all right there in our faces and, and so ugly. Yeah. Well, it has it has come to that. And if nobody buys leather shoes, we all buy tennis shoes. And I'm a, you know, I, as an artist, it works out good for me. But uh, you should have some nice dress-up clothes. Once in a while. Uh, yeah, here I said doing this show because it's uh, we're having a, a second summer. It's going to be 80 degrees uh, here today, and I'm in shorts and and, uh, and flops. But they happen to be a very nice pair of shorts and a very nice uh, polo shirt, uh, and very nice uh, uh, flops, mind you. But um, uh, Scott's wearing a tuxedo, I think. Is what but Scott is wearing a tuxedo to keep up the uh, the overall attire of the program. He's the last David Niven. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of people that dress up and uh, and uh, and, uh, and look the uh, the part, I guess the new James Bond movie is getting rave reviews. Spectre is about ready to come out. Uh, 
But we we just live in an entirely different world. I mean, we have just all fallen to the lowest common denominator. Yeah, well, I, I kind of wanted to address address that just for a second. Okay. Yeah, please. I had a question, and I'm going to pose it to you. I suppose mm -hmm. I'd see what he came up with. I said, uh, uh, what's the one human behavior not acceptable by any societal group? A pedophilia? No, that's not true. Well, there, oh, well, Muslims yeah, don't accept yeah, pedophilia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. so there's no societal group. So you mean this is a behavior <laughs> that is not acceptable by any societal group, including the Islam? Wow. Okay. Have, there's a reason for this. It'll tie it all in. So, uh, well, let's see. No societal group will allow you to uh, to undermine its leaders. They'll, uh, they'll refer to that as treason. So if you undermine the leaders, whether they're religious or political, no societal group will allow you to do that because it's so devastating to the imposition of power. That's partially correct, but there's an easier answer. Okay. Well, I said I got close. So I get partial credit? Okay, you get partial credit. Okay. All right. So what, what is the easier answer? The, the answer that is will never be accepted by any group is being a traitor. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, undermining uh, uh, power. That's the, the, when you're undermining power, the person who is doing that is called a traitor. All right. Yeah. So, so a Judas, you know, a Benedict Arnold, that's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. is yeah. uh, even, even. Uh, uh, an, Edward Snowden. Snowden. an Edward Snowden. Even though what he did was right, he well, is considered, a, he is considered he a traitor. Labeled him a traitor. He's not a traitor. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he, that's presenting the truth that's not a traitor. I, first of all, I, 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 I looked it up. Just I don't even think, I don't even think Benedict Arnold was a traitor, but. Uh, no, he, he was actually, he, he chose sides. Yeah. He chose, uh, chose, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, he, and you know, by the way, the U.S. Revolution was not popular in America. No. So sure. if you were if you were if you were in the uh, revolutionary side, you were actually a traitor. You were a traitor, not only to the government that was empowered, but you and would have been uh, uh, tried and convicted as such. But you were also a traitor to the majority of the colonists. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, right. so he, yeah, Benedict Arnold was on one side, and uh, and saw the uh, the fact that it did not have popular support and was not behaving appropriately, and chose the other side uh, because were, they yeah, and both and both sides were reprehensible. But I would be I would be labeled a traitor because I am opposed to my government. Yeah, but you're not opposed to you're not trying to overthrow it. You walked away from it. You just, That's right. No, I am not. I have no, no interest in overthrowing. It. I mean, go do your thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my view is exactly, uh, you know, says, uh, you know, should we pay our taxes? And he says, you know, show me, uh, show me the coin, and uh, and whose image is on it, whose likeness is on it. Uh, Caesar, well, then, you know, give unto Caesar's that which is Caesar's. And that's my view of it. Is that he just says, you don't have anything to do with it. You know, uh, don't show any loyalty uh, to it. Give it. Let them do their thing, and I think it's appropriate to expose and condemn them, but I'm not, and you're not, advocating the overthrow of the government. You're not, and I'm not advocating any violence. We just want people to be informed so that they recognize that their government is a fraud, uh, that it's counterproductive, that their military is a fraud, that it's counterproductive. And there is an alternative. And their religion is a fraud, and it's counterproductive, huh? and that rather than... than uh, Foolishly trusting these untrustworthy human institutions, there is a wonderful trustworthy alternative. Exactly. Okay, so you are correct that that trying to uh, uh, and you know you use the term traitor and I use the uh, the more uh, complete mm -hmm. um, depiction is that somebody who exposes and tries to undermine the credibility of the uh, predominant political or religious uh, or military uh, institution within a country, there is no country on earth that will allow that. There is no country, no individual, no society whatsoever, down to a tribe. They just right. deal with it. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, and, uh, you go back to the Hawaiian Islands where you kind of really had an isolated group. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the witch doctors, the religious uh, uh, leaders, formed an alliance with the king uh, of those tribes 
such that anyone who did not acquiesce to the tribal uh, imposition of rules was uh, beheaded, yeah. savagely beheaded, their heart they're carved out while they're alive uh, uh, as well. So, you know, they killed tens of thousands of people until there was no more dissent. So dissent is what they will not tolerate. And, uh, and the killing will continue until we have all happy campers. Yeah. Well, so I looked up Trader. Yeah. It says betray. It says uh, from trade to deliver up one who violates his allegiance uh, and betrays the country, breaks mm -hmm. trust, or plays into the hands of the enemy. So I, I said, okay, that's a good definition of what a traitor is. And then I, then I, let me give you an example of in my lifetime, the first time I really recognized uh, that the government is really worse. By the way, is, is exposing, like Snowden, mm -hmm. he exposed the fact that our government was wholly and completely out of control, that it was doing things that were unconstitutional, that uh, that the government was not responsible and was counterproductive. And that's what he exposed. And, of course, that makes the country more vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> it should because, you know, the country is, has made has made very bad decisions that, that the truth makes it more vulnerable. But is exposing the truth really a traitorous act? Even though it does fit part of the definition, it makes the country more vulnerable. Uh, two, two answers. To I, was, I was brought up the truth makes you stronger, not weaker. Yeah, but that's not that's the truth is not an alibi in uh, political correctness. But if you if you uh, if you go into a courtroom, they put the hand on the did uh, did would did William Snow did, did William Snow no, did, did, yeah I know but did William Snow uh, deliver anything that wasn't true? No, not that, not, not that this, uh, this, this hellacious, uh, terrible crime that's being perpetrated by Assad and WikiLeaks for, for actually publishing the, um, the uh, emails of uh, Brenner, giving him a toast of his own, a taste of his own medicine. Uh, is, uh, is, is there anything, that is, is he doing anything that isn't true? <laughs> not if you're quoting him. No, of course not, yeah. When he released the document showing the United States complicity in, uh, in starting the Syrian war. Yeah, uh, if you're publishing the truth, and yet uh, we still want to uh, to call him a traitor, um, truth is not an alibi, is it? No, we newspapers are supposed to tell the truth. You know that was our. Oh, but that's, no, no, now they want to tell the political what's politically correct. Damn the truth. So the one crime that no society will tolerate is that which undermines the, the institutions that are empowered over the people. No society will allow its people to undermine uh, uh, the infrastructure of society, its military, its uh, political leadership, its religious leadership, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, I, uh, I, I kind of went down the same track as you, but I didn't get to the traitor part. Because when he asked me, yeah, I mean, when he asked me, my first thought was murder, and I was like, "Well, no, pretty much every society, you know." Yeah. Well, it's interesting that the when the uh, uh, in the Peloponnesian Wars, you know, when the yeah. Persians or uh, can't beat the Spartans, the little three hundred Spartans plus their helpers, yeah, they, a guy says, "I'll show you a trail around there." So after they actually beat mm -hmm. around the Spartans and finally destroy him, he goes mm -hmm. to the king of Persia and he says, or it was Xerxes or Darius, I forget, but mm -hmm. he says, uh, "He says, okay, I'd like my reward now." So he uh, he said, "Okay, you shall have it." And he sends his guy over there with a sword and cuts off his head. He said, "If, if the Greeks can't trust you, why the hell you think I'm gonna trust you?" <laughs> He didn't put it quite like that, but I'm sorry. My <laughs> I got too casual there. I beg your pardon. But, uh, and, but that's a true story because I was in, at least that's what the Greeks report, what the Persians report. Mm -hmm. That's to the extent that people, uh, you know, if you can't trust you, you can't trust you. Yeah, but, you know, uh, then, then again, think of what the uh, the Persians and Greeks were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the Greeks were uh, were not content to just to have control over their land and their islands. Uh -huh. uh, they wanted to control all trade. It's kind of like America. And they were, and the Greeks were actually uh, imposing democracy. The Delian League was designed to impose the Greeks' 
way of uh, of governing. Now, what's interesting, of course, is the Greeks claim to have uh, installed democracy and then imposed it, which I don't know how you can impose choice. But uh, uh, yet they were uh, <laughs> they were led they were led by kings, and the kings were always the head of the military. Uh, so I, I don't know how that's democracy. But nonetheless, they imposed it, and they imposed it because they wanted to control. Uh, and they, they, they imposed it on others because they wanted to um, control the shipping lanes and, um, and uh, you know, the world's economy, like America does. Uh, and the Persians, would, you know, the king of Persia, he, the half of Persia didn't, didn't get to vote, didn't care. Um, but the Persian king just wanted more territory. He wanted to, uh, to stop anybody interfering with anything that was happening around him. So you just think of the premise. Why were they fighting? And why would somebody be bad if he uh, if he said, you know, I, I don't take, I'm not taking sides in this. I mean, think about it. I mean, what in the world were they fighting for? Uh, money, power, influence. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know that yeah. that begat the best example I have in my early part of my life, which was uh, which I was examining from. Uh, as a young man in Australia before I became of age where they were going to draft me. And mm -hmm. that was the song. And, and, and if you just think about it for a minute, first of all, there's no way whatsoever that that wasn't a planned proxy war with Russia. Correct. We were filling the void of the old British Empire, you know, from mm -hmm. Burma, India, and so forth, and pushing our influence around Asia. We had a... It was a residue left from having an army left in Asia and an army which became NATO left in... Uh, Mm -hmm. And Europe, we, we decided we're going to be the big cheese now. Mm -hmm. But if, if you think about, if we did have a Vietnam, which mm -hmm. was planned, not necessary. Correct. There was 30,000 Americans dead. There was at least 2 million. Oh, 57,000 Americans yeah. dead in Vietnam. Yeah. 30,000 okay. in Korea, but uh, 50, okay, sir, was yeah, it, uh, yeah. essentially 60,000 uh, 60, uh, killed in, uh, in Vietnam. But I mean, look at all the ones that died after the fact and died suicide. Oh, suicide, and oh yeah, and then, and then there's also suicide by cop when they just came back and they were belligerent because they wanted to get killed. Unbelievable yeah. uh, 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 wounded amount. Oh. They, we had a secret war in Laos that killed over a million people. Yeah. They had every report I've read. And, yeah, it's like the, uh, the, the last two wars, but particularly the war in uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had ten times the mutilated that we had uh, killed. So we brought people back with, uh, you know, with one arm, one leg, uh, you know, faces burned, skulls crushed. I mean, oh yeah, the carnage that we had. Think about this on the other side of the coin. To them, they didn't have a hospital to take them back to. These people, who they lived, yeah, had to live with a, a, a stub and a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, my God. Oh, yeah, the, the consequence of America's invasion of those countries is seen by the population every day of uh, people with, uh, with sawed-off uh, arms and stubs as uh, legs and, uh, and one eye and burns over most of their body. Uh, they view every day what we have done to them, and uh, they do not love us for having done it. No, it has a different um, idea and a whole different proposal, and he says, and you should respond and answer appearing before and approaching the maternal manifestation of the light which purifies, enlightens, and elevates, to approach Yahweh. And he says, this shall come on a day in which there shall not be a diminishing of his esteemed and beloved light. Zechariah 14.6 uh, And then Yosha says, you know, I've told you in advance, which means... You ought to look at where he told you in advance, and the only place he told us in advance about this is in Zechariah 6, which he's citing here. I've told you in advance. For just as a brilliant shining constellation rising as a star in the east to bring forth light, causing it to shine brilliantly and resplendently to the far extent of the setting sun in the west, so in the same manner shall the presence of the Son of Man be. So uh, he's not coming back uh, diminished, and um, and if you're not prepared for his uh, return, you're going to be obliterated. Isn't that the case? That's exactly what he says. So you won't survive the uh, the light. 
so that's why he precedes this by saying, come in to answer my invitation and come into the presence of the uh, maternal manifestation of my life, into the set of our spirit. Yeah. That's why these things are tied together, because his return is going to be on Yom Kippur, where he emphasizes this very instruction. Huh? Then the Yahweh says, it shall be the one day he becomes known to approach and according to Yahweh. Zechariah 14.7. It shall be, it shall exist as Haya. It was, it is, it always will be. The one, the exclusive, the unique, the certain. Day, Yom, singular. He becomes known, is personally revealed, is understood, is acknowledged. Yada. To approach and according to law. Yahweh. You're familiar with the, uh, the old line um, where the, uh, in the, in the Christian New Testament, it says that, you know, no one knows the day. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, it's a Greek corruption uh-huh. of this statement. The statement is, it's the one and only day, the exclusive day, that he becomes known. And it can be figured out. He's given you all the evidence in the world. So all you've got to do is, when he said, I've told you in advance how he's going to return, and you look at there's only one place that we're told in advance how he's going to return, and that's Zachariah, that just like when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's citing Psalm 22, the opening line of Psalm 22. And if you want to know what's happening, you want the answer to that question, then you read Psalm 22. In this case, if you want to know something about his return, then you go to the place that he just quoted. Mm-hmm. Remember, I just told you in advance, the only place he told us in advance is Zechariah in the 14th chapter. You read the next statement, and the next statement explains what has been corrupted in, uh, in Christianity. It's not a day that is known only to the Father and, uh, and unknown to everyone else. It's the day that is expressly known, that he becomes known, mm-hmm. the one day. And so he's reemphasizing this is going to occur on the uh, Day of Reconciliations. It's Yom Kippurim, the day well, let me, of let me reconciliations. Suggest, let me suggest to you that even as Christians, mm-hmm. when we were Christians, we knew, at least I, I knew he was coming in the fall, so I knew it was going to be this one or that one, so I knew mm-hmm. it was pretty, a pretty good guess it would be Yom Kippurim. You also were told... Yeah, it's only, only, you only have three options. Yeah, you only got three options. You've got, yeah, you've got, you've got, uh, right. you've got Teruah, uh, Yom Kippurim, or Sukkah. You've got those three options. And trumpets, we knew trumpets wasn't it. So it was right, because, yeah, because he, he's constantly associating, uh, trumpets, Teruah, with, uh, with his harvest of his, uh, of his uh, children, of the covenant children. So, so you knew it couldn't be, it couldn't be that one. So it had to be one of these other two. It's either Yom Kippurim or the um, or uh, on Sukkah. But doesn't he and and, uh, and Zachariah say, and they will look upon me whom they have uh, pierced? And doesn't he then tell us in Yirmiyah that uh, uh, that uh, that upon his return that his children uh, call out his name and recognize that? And they say, Yahweh is our God, and when he's going to say, then, then you are my children, and um, it, it, doesn't he tell you that it's happening? It, it, in fact, even in Zechariah here, the mm-hmm. preceding chapter, doesn't it say that this is going to occur on Yom Kippur? Mm-hmm. So, so now we know the day. <laughs> mm-hmm. The day. And it's going yeah. to be one year. We may not know the year, but we know that day at this point. We know the day. Yeah, for sure. But, but let me. But then, if you extrapolate just a little bit more, is there <laughs> mm-hmm. any big event that didn't happen that wasn't a Yobel year? Well, not only did everything happen on a Yobel year, they didn't just happen on Yobel years. Mm-hmm. It wasn't just. Yeah, been a lot of Yobel years because that's every fifty years. Been a lot of Yobel years since Adam and Chawa were uh, were rebooted from the garden, but it's every forty Yobel. Forty, 40. Okay. yeah, and you know, forty is the is the common denominator of all of these periods. That you know, it rained for forty days and forty nights. I, I, the children of Israel were kept enslaved for four hundred years. They, 
the uh, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for uh, 40 uh, years. The you know, it was tested uh, 40 days and 40. Everything is 40, mm-hmm. right? All right. And so everything that happens that's important happens on a Yobel because a Yobel is presented as part of this uh, continuation of the framework of the Mikra, of the invitations to meet with God, in the same book, Kara, and it explains that it is the time that all debts are forgiven. Oh, boy, that's important. Mm-hmm. That the people are returned to the land, and the land becomes Yahweh. That means that, that Israel is his, and that's the is a metaphor for Eden and heaven. And that uh, uh, that uh, uh, all uh, people are freed. Well, we've got to be freed and liberated. That's the whole purpose of the Torah. We have to have our debts forgiven. That is the purpose of the Mikre. And we have to return to the uh, the land. That's where they lead. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Right. Okay, so it's got to happen on a Yobel year. So now all you got to do is figure, okay, what happened 40 Yobel from the time that Adam and Chawa were booted from Eden? Well, 40 Yobel. A four-year-old bill, then you have um, that's, uh, Noah. No, that's that's uh, that's twenty-year bill. Oh, okay, a forty. That's a thousand days. years. A thousand years. We have a, a dress rehearsal for the covenant, Abraham. where Noah had to listen to and act upon Yahweh's instructions. He had to listen to, understand, accept, and act upon Yahweh's instructions, and engage in that regard, and uh, and that became a uh, a, a living. A testimony to the nature of the covenant where those that did that, those expressed things, were saved. So that was that was actually 20 Yobel or a thousand years. What happened 40 Yobel from the time that Adam and Chow were booted from the garden? Well, after, after that you have Noah, then you have Abraham. I mean, so yeah, but exactly, uh, wasn't Abraham uh, taken to Mount Moriah yeah. on uh, Pesach and didn't uh, didn't uh, you should say exactly at that time and 2,000 years after they were booted from the Garden of Eden that he would provide the uh, the lamb for the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And uh, and wasn't that the moment the covenant was affirmed? And isn't the covenant the means that individually we return to, um, to life camping out with God, uh, the equivalent of Eden, mm-hmm. the means to return? Right. And then to what happened... Um, uh, we'll just go with a, a thousand Yobel or a thousand years. Uh, twenty Yobel. What happened twenty Yobel, Yobel later from um, from the affirmation of the covenant? Did anything get built in any place yeah, of importance? The first temple. Solomon Solomon built uh, the temple with material provided by Dod. Correct. That was exactly in 967, 968 BCE. Exactly a thousand years later, which would now be forty Yobel from the time that. The covenant was affirmed with Abraham that enabled all of us to uh, to engage in a relationship with God and be part of his family. Exactly 40 Yobel, in exactly the same place. Same spot. Uh, and, and exactly the same day of the year mm-hmm. on Pesach. Now we have what, what happened? We have 33 C, then we have uh, Yosha, uh, uh, the events of Passover, and the week of month, the most important week of months of Elul. Yeah. They had Pesach. He fulfilled Pesach, Matzah, Bukhotam, and Shavuah Later. on the right days, exactly 40 uh, Yobel after um, uh, Adam, after Abraham and uh, and Yishak, Yahweh and Yosha uh, met to uh, to provide a dress rehearsal for these events and to affirm the covenant. And so, what happens? What would what year would it be if we go exactly 40 Obel, 2,000 years, from 33 CE when these were the first four Moed Mikre were fulfilled in uh, in Jerusalem? What if we go 2,000 and we go back to 30? I mean, uh, 2033. Hmm. So 2033 has to be a Yobel year, and not yeah, just an ordinary Yobel year. It's one of those. Uh, it's one of the 40 times uh, times 50 from the fulfillment of the first Moed Mikre. But, but my point was, even if you didn't know that and you were reading the typical Bible or listening mm-hmm. to the preacher, mm-hmm. you, they all, all the prophecy ones, talk, prophecy preachers will always talk about this is in the days that Israel has returned and we knew right. when they were thrown, mm-hmm. you know, when they were the spoiler took place and we know mm-hmm. when they returned, 1948, which is, is quite significant because 1947 to me, uh, that they found the Disney Scrolls, so, uh, that was, mm-hmm. uh, not a coincidence to me. But they, they, that happens. And now we have only two Yobels in that period of time, right? That, um, from there.
there to there that it could happen. Correct. So if they're not, that generation won't pass that lives in that time. You, so we're we're down to one year. It didn't happen the last year, Bill. It's, we're down to one year, Bill, left. Well, that is correct. But, so, I mean, you could but, it, but, it, but there's no way it could have happened at the previous one because that would have been 39, Yo Bell. Yeah. 39 doesn't mean anything with Yahweh. No. 40 does. 40 does. And so, so, he didn't know that, you know, well, guys, you know, we're, our time's running out. It has to be here yeah. if, y'all, if y'all is telling the truth. Yeah, and all you have to do is there, there's no dispute at the at the year of uh, of uh, you know, Yosha's fulfillment of Passover, uh, unyeasted bread, uh, first fruits, and um, the promise of seven, of weeks. No. There's no dispute that that took place in 33 CE. In fact, it was predicted by Daniel that it was going to take place in 33 CE. Down to the day. Yeah, down, yeah, down to no. the exact no. day. And then he would waltz into Jerusalem, not for himself to be cut off. Uh, and, uh, and so there's no dispute on any of that. And why is it that we just can't do the simple math? Everybody knows that there are seven Mikre, that the, the Shabbat plan is uh, six plus one equals seven, that the Mikre plan is six plus one equals seven, and that everything that Yahweh says that's important is based on seven. You know, it's, this is not difficult to make this connection, to understand by connecting the evidence. So your point is, Kirk, that um, you don't really have to think this through to any great extent. If you're open-minded, if you're interested in what God has to say. You should be able to figure this out. Right. And particularly particularly since he even told you, that, listen, I've told you before, and all you got to do is, is look where he talked about his return coming back as light. I mean, every every decent Bible, even even with their horrible translations, you know, has a column down the side that gives you a reference. You can Google it online and say. Yeah, well, verses are usually printed on a lot of Bibles, so I mean, you yeah. get an old one and still get there. Yeah, I've got a forty-year-old uh, uh, New American Standard Bible that I use uh, for exactly this purpose because it has a column down the side that it uh, that anything that, that is in the uh, that is uh, um, said elsewhere that is similar is referenced right they, they call it a concordance too you know it's it's, it's not hard to figure out huh. so now you know the year and you know the day and now you know the year and the day yeah, it's Yom Kippur in uh, 2033, and all you got to do is look up the, the moon phases by uh, of that year, and uh, you know that if you were to translate that into our pagan calendar, it's uh, October uh, 2nd. You know, and you want to know what time it is, uh, the only place that he, that he cares about, because he says he's coming back at, uh, at, at uh, sunset, it's uh, 6.22 p.m., in Jerusalem. <laughs> you know, October second, twenty. You know, you know if, you, if you wanted to go down to the second, you could you could you could define it uh, to the second. He, he's going to be right on time. Yeah, he's very punctual. Right, he's very punctual, and it just as an affirmation, the uh, the millennial celebration of uh, of Sukkah, because Sukkah is according to Yahweh is equivalent to the Shabbat. In fact, he says that over and over again. The Sukkah and the Shabbat are the same concept. Uh, so would you expect then in 2033, which is uh, year 6,000, yeah, when uh, we, five days after Yom Kippur, that we're going to uh, celebrate Sukkah, that it will commence on a Friday evening so that his return has to be on a Monday? I, I think that would... Uh, uh, and guess what? In 2033. Okay. Guess what? Suka uh, begins with um, with uh, on a Friday evening, and guess what happens on that Friday evening? The Shabbat. Well, you saw, of course, it's the beginning of the Shabbat. Mm-hmm. But you know, these blood moons that they're talking about, these, these yeah, the stunning day. sights in the sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Guess what happens? It's not only a blood moon; it's a super moon. The next super blood moon. Uh, full eclipse uh, of the moon, one of the most beautiful sights to see, particularly when it's a supermoon. Um, yeah, it's going to occur on the, that Friday evening uh, in 2033. And we're going to see it from both sides. Yeah, we're going to be able to see it from both sides. <laughs> Although from the other side. Well, I can explain why. Uh, from the other side, it's always an eclipse, but, but <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You can just rotate around. 
Okay. Things will be much quicker than you are now. I'll be, oh, boy. <laughs> so then, then this is what it says in the uh, in Matignon. Now, this Matignon recorded this. Uh, this was spoken to Matignon, who was in the audience when this was being said. There was only uh, 12 people in the audience at this moment. And uh, he, uh, he heard this come out of Yosha's mouth in Hebrew. And he wrote it down in Hebrew. And somewhere around 100 years later, it was uh, translated into Greek. And we're, we're reading it now translated out of, uh, of Greek. And it says, so too, when you, all, when you see all of these things, recognize that I am nigh. And indeed, at the threshold, at the opening of the doorway, Indeed, I say, this is sure and true. This generation will not pass by until all of these things take place. So when, when he's, he's already talked about Israel becoming a nation again, he's already talked about world war and rumors of war, he's talked about an onslaught of terrorism around the world, he's talked about famines and pestilence. He's talked about uh, an increase in earthquakes and an increase in storms like uh, tornadoes and the uh, the like. Asteroid. Yeah, the asteroid. He's laid it all out as to uh, what's going to, uh, to happen. And he says, when you see, and then the last sign that he gave was Israel becoming a nation again. When you see all of this take place, you're going to know that indeed I am at the door. What door do you think he's at? I think that's the Passover door where the lamb came through the gate, or whichever yeah. analogy you wish. Yeah. yeah, when you see all these happen, know that I'm at the door. I'm at the door. And that, uh, and that he's going to move through that door and going to be visible bright as a, as a constellation returning to our planet on Yom Kippur, 2033. Mark your calendar.